Welcome back everyone to another college algebra lecture. Today we are going to start talking about inverse functions. Now inverse functions are pretty important in mathematics and they show up in a lot of different fields and hopefully you'll find that they're pretty easy to get your mind wrapped around. Now before we can start on inverse functions themselves we do need to talk about a certain property that functions can have called being one-to-one. -one. Now Saying a function is one to one, all that means to us is that the y values do not repeat. Or in a little bit more official math language, two different inputs or x values in the domain correspond to two different outputs or y values in the range, which again, that just means that y values do not repeat. Now, looking at the graphics I have right here, this relation is a function that is one-to-one. -one. The reason I can say it's one-to-one -one is none of these y values have repeated. Now repeat means that they don't go to two different x's. So a unique x has a unique y. This is one-to-one. -one. Now the relation beside it, that is not one-to-one -one because this single x or y value has two different x's. So if we were to look at this as a set of ordered pairs, this would be x1 comma y1, x2 comma y1. The y value repeated. Now this last one, this one is not even a function. The reason this one's not a function, if you remember from chapter one, x values cannot repeat for functions. So looking right here, I have two different y values with the same x. So this x repeated. So this is one to one, this is a non one-to-one -one function, and this is not even a function. Now, it's been a while since we covered functions, so I want to give you a little recap of one-to-one -one and uh, functions themselves, because their definitions are fairly similar. So for something to be one-to-one, -one, all that means is y values do not repeat. So for one-to-one, -one, it has to be a function and the y values do not repeat. For a relation to be a function, we've covered this in the past, x values do not repeat. Now, these are very similar and we're gonna find out when we talk about inverses that they're pretty well tied together. Okay. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna determine if some functions are one-to-one. -one. And by doing that, and to do that, we're just gonna look at sets of ordered pairs. So each one of these sets of ordered pairs represents a function. I wanna see if it's one-to-one. -one. Now, looking at the very first one, I know my definition of one-to-one -one means that the y values do not repeat. So looking at the y values, I have five, eight, 11, and 14. None of them repeat, therefore, this one is one-to-one. -one. That's it. That's all I gotta say. So looking at B, doing the same exact thing, the Y value, I have seven, five, seven, and 11. Here, seven repeats. So since seven repeats, this is not one-to-one. -one. And that's it. That's all you gotta do to check on these. Now, to do two more, just to share everything up. This one, we look at the y values, 12, 18, 18, 21, 18 repeats. So this one is not one to one. And for the last one, four, nine, 15, and 17, none of them repeat. Therefore, we have a one to one function. And that's it. Now, you might be wondering, this is really easy. What's going to make it hard? Well, not really anything's going to make this difficult, but you are right. This is easy whenever you have it listed out as sets of ordered pairs. But as we have learned, this is not the norm. Most of the time, you're going to be given a graph or something written in function notation, f of x equals something with x's and numbers. That's going to take a little bit more effort to figure out but not too terribly much. So the way that we're gonna figure out how something is one-to-one, -one, if you're given a graph 
or uh, function notation is you're going to use what is called the horizontal line test. And again, we have done something very similar to this in the past. So the horizontal line test says that if you can draw a line horizontally across and it crosses your graph more than once, then your function is not one to one. So looking right here, this is my graph drawing a horizontal line, I see that I intersect more than once. If I intersect more than once, I am not one to one. Now, the reason this works is looking at these two points right here, I see they share the same exact Y value. That's why drawing it horizontally, crossing more than once, the same exact Y value shows up. So why does this test work? The horizontal line test, HLT, shows if y values repeat. And what that means to us, cross more than once. So it crosses more than. That's how it works. Now, if we draw a horizontal line and it does not cross more than once, then that means that our function is one to one. So that's all you got to check. If it doesn't cross more than once, you're one to one. If it does cross more than once, you're not one to one. Problem solved. Okay, so now let's take that and apply it to some graphs and functions. Okay. So looking at the very first one, A, I have a graph. And looking at this, I can see that this is not the graph of a one-to-one -one function because I can draw a horizontal line right here, and not just right there, in multiple spots. And I see that I cross one, two, three, four times. I cross way more than twice. So if I cross more than once, it is not one to one. And it's not one to one because it fails the horizontal line test. That's it. All you got to do. Now, looking at the next one, here, no matter where I draw my horizontal line, I see that I only cross once. So if I only ever cross once, wherever I draw a line, this is a one to one function passes the horizontal line test. That's all you do. So if you're given a graph, draw some horizontal lines and just figure out if you're one to one. Now, the next two, this will give us a chance to figure out what we do in case you're given a function written out in function notation. Well, all you do is stick it in a graphing calculator or whatever you use to graph and see if it gives you a graph that's one to one. That's it. So looking at this very first one, I can go right here and look at my graph. I have x to the third plus four. Looking at the graph, I see that no matter where I draw a horizontal line, it only crosses once. Now, it might look a little fishy right here, but this does go up constantly, so it's not a flat line. This passes the horizontal line test. Therefore, we have a one-to-one -one function and we're done. OK, now for this last one, D, I don't even need to put it in the calculator. Because I see that this is x squared minus 3. That means this is a quadratic function, and therefore, the graph is a parabola. Now, just in case you, for some reason, don't remember that that's going to give you a parabola, you can double check. So I have x squared minus 3. It's a parabola, just like we thought. This fails the horizontal line test quite miserably. So all I'd say is not one to one. Fails horizontal line test. And that's it. So we now know that one to one means that y values do not repeat. 
We can check for that if you're given a set of ordered pairs. You can also use the horizontal line test to see if a graph or function is one-to-one. -one. All right, now that we have one-to-one -one under our belts, we can actually move into inverse functions proper. Now, the reason we had that is because when we find the inverse of a function f, that original function f needs to be one-to-one. -one. So right here, so suppose that f is a one-to-one -one function. That's going to be important to us. That's the only reason we went over this. Well, when you talk about inverses, I want you to think about just the word inverse itself. That means opposite, reverse, undo, flip, whatever you want to say. An inverse undoes the original. Now, a good way to think about this, and it doesn't involve math, imagine standing somewhere, and then your original function says that you walk forward two steps. Well, the inverse of that would be go backwards two steps. The inverse undid the original, and you ended where you began. Another example, and this one's kind of on the silly side, imagine you have your shoes and they are untied. That's where you start. Well, the original function tells you to tie your shoes. The inverse would be to untie your shoes. So an inverse undoes the original, and you will always end where you started. Now, the notation that we use for inverses is this symbol right here, f with a little negative one above it. Now, make sure you say the right thing. This is read f inverse, not f to the negative one. So f inverse, f with little negative one above it. All right, so for our next little exercise on here, I just want us to get a good idea of what inverses are doing. So right here, these two boxes go with the original function f. So these are the x values, these are the, are the inputs, these are the outputs. So our function f takes 1 to 12, negative 8 to 13, 22 to 27, and negative 84 to 84. What I want us to do now is to fill in the outputs for the inverse. So for the inverse, we're going to take 12 to some number and so on. Well, we know inverses undo the original. So if the original took 1 to 12, the inverse will take 1 backwards, or sorry, we'll take 12 backwards to 1. It undid it. It went backwards. So if negative 8 went to 13, the inverse means 13 will go backwards to negative 8. Now with 27, it'll go backwards to 22, and 84 will go backwards to negative 84. So the inverse undoes the original, and that's all there is to it. Now, there is another way to think about these that's a little bit clearer and gives you kind of a good property to get a grasp on, but it's a little bit easier to see if we write it in uh, ordered pairs. So I'm going to go ahead and do that real quick. Writing out the original in ordered pairs, I have 1, 12, then I have negative 8, comma 13, 22, comma 27, and then negative 84, comma 84. So those are the ordered pairs that go in the original. We can find it by pairing those together. Now let's write down the ordered pairs that went with the inverse. So right here, I'll have 12, comma 1. Then I'll have 13, comma negative 8. Now, taking a step back, I notice something's going on. The x and y values are just switching. I'm going backwards. x and 1, 12, 12, 1. Negative 8, 13, 13, negative 8. So I know this one is going to be 27, comma, 22. And this one will be 84, comma, negative 84. So inverses undo the original. But an easier way to process this in your brain, inverses switch the x and y. That means they would go backwards. So inverses switch 
x and y. That is the best way to kind of cement this in your brain. It goes backward, that just means x and y switch. Okay, and now that we know that the x and y values switch, I can kind of give you a first glimpse into why being one-to-one -one was so important for us. So let's take a gander at this. This won't be included on the regular notes. I'm just kind of going off-road right here for you. I am going to give you a set of word pairs. And it'll be short. So I have one comma two, four comma five, and three comma two. So this is the original. Yeah. Well, looking at this one, oops, forgot a parentheses right here. This one is a function. None of the x values repeat. So are you looking at this? Function check. But this one is not one to one because the twos repeat. So one to one, no. Now, the reason it's so important for the original function to be one to one is this right here. If I list out my values for f inverse, I know the x and y's are going to switch. So it's 2 comma 1, 5 comma 4, and then 2 comma 3. Looking at this right here, the 2's repeat. This is not a function anymore. That's why being one-to-one -one was so important for the original, because if the original is not one-to-one, -one, that means that the inverse will not be a function. So right here, original f, not one-to-one, -one, that means that inverse is not a function. That's why it was so important to us. So never forget that we want the original be one one so that the inverse is a function. All right, so now let's keep going. This next example is gonna be pretty straightforward, but we kind of need it so we can build up to a little property. That's pretty straightforward. Looking at this one, the original function is listed out here and looking at it, it is a function and it is also one-to-one. -one. So that's my function f. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna list out what the inverse function is. So down here, we have the inverse function. Well, by this point, we know that all we gotta do is switch the x and y. So going through switching all the x's and y's, we now have the inverse function, really quick. And this one is a function because the original was one to one. We're all good. Now the extra thing I wanna do is I want to state the domain and range of the original and its inverse. So starting with the domain, which we know consists of the x values. So the domain of f, the x values, one, two, three, four. Pretty quick. Now the range of f, those are the y values. I have 5, 8, 11, and 14. So 5, 8, 11, and 14. Got it. Okay, well, now doing the inverse, my domain of f inverse, x values 5, 8, 11, and 14. So 5, 8, 11, and 14. And for the range of f inverse, we now have 1, 2, 3, and 
Now, something really special is going on. The domain and range switch places. So the domain of the original 1, 2, 3, 4 became the range of the inverse 1, 2, 3, 4. The reason that happened is the X and Y switched. So here, this recommended, if this represented the X values, it now became the Y values of the inverse. And the same goes for the range and domain uh, for the original and inverse. 5, 8, 11, 14 for the range became the domain 5, 8, 11, 14 because the Y and X switch places. So that is very important and will help us out later. Now, this property right here, domain and range of inverses, that's exactly what we just did. Just written out a little bit more formal math language. So domain and range switch places. Okay, I'll actually write that down. Domain and range switch. So domain and range uh, switch x, y. That will help us out a little bit later. All right, now for our next one. This property allows us to test to see if two functions are inverses of each other. So doing this one, it's a pretty cool property and it involves composite functions that we learned last time. So if we have functions f and g, they will be inverses of each other if and only if f composed with g of x is equal to x and g composed with f of x is equal to x. Now, what's going on here is when you compose them, after you get finished reducing and all that fun stuff, you will be left simply with x each way you do this. If you end up with x only for both, the two are inverses. Now, if you ever fully reduce and it doesn't equal x by itself, then they're not inverses and you're done. Now, I do want to take a moment and show you why this is true. Using what we know about invert or composite functions, we know how to trace them using tables. So looking right here, if I were to compose these two, this would be my original input. It takes me to 12. This is the new input. It takes me back to one. This took me back to the original, one to one. Negative eight went to 13. 13 went to negative eight. It went back to the original. 22 to 22, negative 84 to negative 84. The inverses undo each other, and I get 1 comma 1, negative 8 comma negative 8. The only function that gives you the same exact number out that you put in is the function x. So y equals x gives you the same thing out. That's why this works out. OK, so now let's apply that to these. For this example, I have uh, part A and part B. I want you to see if the functions f and g are inverses. Well, we know how to do this now. So to test it out, I'm going to start by doing f of g of x. So based on what we did last time, I'm going to start with f. I know g is equal to 1 half x minus 4. Well, looking at f now, I know f starts with 2. There's an x, so I'll do parentheses, 1 half x minus 4, and then plus 8. Distributing the 2, 2 times 1 half is just going to give me x minus 8 plus 8. Negative 8 plus 8 gives me, will cancel out, and I just get x left over. Perfect. So this one worked out. Now, you can't leave it there. You have to test the other one. So testing this one, I now have g of f of x. So that's going to be g of, right here, I have 2x plus 8. So g is 1 half. Instead of x, I'll do 2x plus 8, then minus 4. Distributing the 1 half, that will give me x plus 4 minus 4. That reduces down to x. 
composing both directions, I ended with x. This means f and g are inverses. All done. That's what you need to do. Compose them both directions. If you get x for each one, they are inverses. So doing one more to kind of shear this up a little bit, we're going to start off with f of g of x. So that's going to be f of the cube root of x plus 2. Well, I see that I'm going to start with x. I'm going to do my parentheses, cube root x plus 2 to the third power plus 2. Well, the cube root and the third power are going to cancel, and I get x plus 2 plus 2. Reducing this, I get x plus 4. That cannot reduce any further. So since this does not equal x, all I have to say is f and g are not inverses. And that's it. And I only needed to test one of them because they both have to reduce down to x. This one didn't, so that means the entire thing is finished because I can't reduce that down to x. And that's it. That's how you can test and see if they're inverses or not. Okay, so onward to another property that's related to that. This property deals with the graphs of inverses. So the property says that if f uh, has an inverse, the inverse will be the, or the graph of the inverse will be the reflection of the original about the line y equals x. Now, this y equals x, that's what we can get from the composition. Now, this might seem complicated, but it's actually really straightforward we know that the x and y values switch. So yet again, inverses switch x and y. We know that. We'll take a look at each one of these points. A1, B1, to get to its corresponding point, you switch them. B1, A1, done. A2, B2, switch those b2, a2. The corresponding point you can find by just switching the x and y. And it's always going to be on the opposite side of the line y equals x. So when you're done, you should be able to turn it to the side and it looks like a mirror image directly across. Okay. So continuing on with these, looking at this first one, this is my original f. I want to graph the inverse. Well, all you have to do is take the points that you are given and reverse them. So this point is going to switch to be negative 2, negative 2. It stayed the same. Right here, negative 1, 0 is going to become 0, negative 1. Done. 0, 1 becomes 1, 0. And then 1, 2 becomes 2, 1. And now to connect them, it's a little bit easier if you turn it on its side and now match them. This one had a line going there, a line up here, and a line right there. So within artistic differences, they should look like mirror images of each other across. And they were easy to find by just reversing the point. Okay, so looking at our next one, this one right here, reversing it, gives me negative 1, negative 1. Reversing this gives me 2, negative 1, or 2, 1, sorry. So I get 1, comma, 2. Now, I claim there's one more point right here at the origin. That point is 0, 0. Switching it stays 0, 0. Now, graphing this one, 
turning it on its side, I see this one's kind of going to bow out a little bit, and it goes right here. And this one kind of bows out and goes right there. And again, to artistic differences, they're about the same. Now, now that we've seen two of these, I want you to notice that there is a certain property going on. The property is any point that is on the diagonal itself stays the exact same. The reason is any point on this diagonal, the X and Y values are the exact same. So when they switch, they stay the same. So that's a really good thing for us to know. This one stay the same, that stay the same, and I knew that one was gonna stay the same as well. That'll help us on one of these. Okay, now looking at C, two, negative two, one becomes one, negative two, which is a point right here. So one, negative two. And now one, negative one, it's going to become negative one, one, right here. Okay, so trying to get these to match up a little bit, I know I have my point zero, zero right there. This one looks like it curves up to zero, so it's gonna curve that way. And this one looks like it kind of goes under, so this one will go a little under. There we go, roughly the same-ish. Now the last one, this one's a bit more on the fun side. I don't have the numbers for points, but I can at least say that anything on the diagonal is the exact same. Got it. So now turning it on its side, I see that this one is gonna need to go out that direction to make it a mirror image. This one's gonna have to curve up a little this one will curve this direction, and this one will go out that way. And we're done. That's all you need for graphing inverses. Points along diagonal stay the same, and if you don't have those, just invert points that you can find. All right, so, so far we know how to deal with inverses if they are uh, on a graph. We can test to see if they're inverses. We can list them out if they're sets of ordered pairs. But those aren't always the most common thing to do. As we've seen, the most common thing is to want something in proper function notation. And that's what we're about to move into next. So looking right here, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you the original function f of x written out in regular function notation. I want us to find the inverse function written out in function notation as well. This is the most common way of doing inverses and probably the most important. So we will spend some time on this part and that's going to be the bulk of your homework as well. Now, I understand most of y'all prefer it if I give you step-by-step -step instructions and that's exactly what I did up here. So step one is we're gonna change f of x to y. Step two, we'll switch the x and y. And step three, we're gonna solve the previous one for y. Then we'll change y to f inverse. And finally, step five is a little detailed. What I just went through probably meant nothing. So let's actually work a problem so you can see what's going on. So starting off on this one, our original function, f of x equals three x minus 15. I want to find the inverse function for this. Well, step one says change f of x to y. So I have y equals 3x minus 15. Got it. Step two says to switch the place of x and y. So now I'll have x equals 3y minus 15. All I did was just switch their place. Step three, this is where the real math comes into play. We're going to solve and get y by itself, because that's what we want for functions. So I'll add 15. So x plus 15 equals 3y. Then to get y by itself, I'm going to divide both sides by the 3. Depending on what book your homework is assigned from, some books will want you to leave it as a big fraction like this. Personally, I like it whenever it's split up into two different pieces so it's easier to read. 
So this will be one third x plus five equals y. Now, once y is on a side by itself, we are close to finish with every single thing we need. Instead of y, I'm gonna switch it back to f inverse. And I know y is equal to one third x plus five. All done, nothing else to do, except for step five. Step five, this is only needed in certain cases. And the certain cases I will get into in just a moment, but right now, what you need to know is if F inverse is not one-to-one, -one, we're gonna have to restrict the domain. So at this point, always check, is F inverse one-to-one? -one? Looking at this, I see that this is a linear function, mx plus b, that's a straight line, that is one-to-one. -one. We are finished. Nothing else to do on this one. Okay. Now let's do it again. So looking at B, I know I'm going to change Y or F of X to Y. And I have the same rest of the stuff. Now I'll switch places. So I have X equals two Y to the fifth plus four. Next up, solve for Y. I'm going to move the four over. So X minus four equals two Y to the fifth. Now I'll divide by the two. And again, I'm going to separate them. So I have one half X minus two equals Y to the fifth. Now at this point, I have to take the fifth root to get rid of that five. So looking at this one, I now have the fifth root of one half x minus two equals y. Okay, we're basically done. Y is on a side by itself. So all I have to do now is say that f inverse equals the fifth root of one half x minus two. Okay, now the next thing we have to do is check to see if this sucker is one to one. Now, depending on if you have a uh, graphing calculator or not, depends on how you're going to do this. If you have a nice TI like this one, you can put the fifth root in there as it is. If not, you're going to need to change it to uh, uh, the one fifth power. So right here, I can do math, go to five. That gives me an option to put the five in there. Now I have one over two, then X minus two. Now, this one is a little deceptive. And if you're using Desmos for this, you can zoom in and make it a little bit easier to see. This might look like it's a flat line, but it's actually constantly going up. So this one is one to one. And we're done. Now, if you don't know what I was talking about a moment ago about changing it to be the one fifth power, if your calculator doesn't have access to put um, the fifth root, what you would do is you would do parentheses, one half X minus two, close the parentheses. Now in the exponent, do one divided by five. That's a property that you should know, um, but just in case you don't, I wanna tell you right now, whatever the number is out on the index or the ledge is gonna be the denominator for that fraction. Looking at it, you get the same exact so don't freak out if your calculator does not have access to put the fifth root. Now, for both of these, the new function was one-to-one, -one, which is great. But what happens if it is not? That's where things start to go a little south or sideways. So let's take a look right up here, or down here, I should say. We're going to go through this pretty quick, figuring out uh, what the inverse is. So I have y equals square root two x plus eight. Now x equals square root of two y plus eight. 
To get rid of the square root, we have to square both sides. So now I have x squared equals 2y plus 8. Subtract the 8. Now divide by the 2. And at this point, I now have 1 half x squared minus 4 equals y. So once y is on a side by itself, we are still going to do f inverse of x equals 1 half x squared minus 4. Now, here is where we kind of should get a red flag that something's going on wonky. This is a quadratic. That means it's a parabola. This is not 1, 2, 1. So looking at the graph of this one, x, x squared minus 4, we have further evidence that it is not 1 to 1. Now, what we have to do in this case is restrict the domain. Now, restricting the domain sounds pretty complicated, but it's actually pretty straightforward. When we restrict it, that just means that we take out x values that we don't need. So looking at this, I see that this fails the horizontal line test, but if I cover up the right side, it's now a one-to-one -one function. Or if I cover up the left side, it's a one-to-one -one function. So if I cover up one side of the graph, it's one-to-one, -one, that means I can restrict it and everything will be just peachy. But here is the kicker. I said I can cover up the right or I can cover up the left. How do you know which side to get rid of and what side to keep? That is the detail. So let's go back up here real quick and look at the steps. If f inverse is not one-to-one, -one, we have to restrict. That just means take away a side. So right here, all this means is uh, take away a side. That's it. We'll just cover up the left, cover up the right, make our life easier. But to figure out the left and right side, which one to keep, you need to remember inverses switch the domain and range. That's the most important part right there. So the domain of your new function, the one that we want to keep, will be the range of the old function. Domain of f inverse will be the range of the original. Now, the easy way to do this, take a look right here. I'm going to put the original in. I have 2x plus 8 inside my square root. Here's my graph. Make sure you can see it. Figure out what the range is. Now, the range, those are the y values, the lowest to highest. The lowest y value that I see that I can equal starts at zero, and then it goes up, and it's going to go up forever. So my range for this one is y greater than or equal to zero. Well, once I know the range of the original, the domain of the new one is the same thing, except instead of x or instead of y, it's now x. So x greater than or equal to zero. And that is required for your answer to be complete. So the range of the original became the domain of the new one. Now what that means to us looking back at this, putting it back in, I want x values that are greater than or equal to zero. That means x zero and greater goes that way. 
what I did is I covered up the left and I kept the right side. This x to zero is now a one-to-one -one function. Now, some teachers that you may have had in the past said cover up the left and always keep the right. That's not always true. That's why I'm showing you the proper way. The range is what you look at. Okay, so I know that part's confusing. So I have three more examples to go over this. All right, but this problem is finished now and you do need to include that part about the domain for this to be correct. Okay, let's do this one more time. So changing this over, I'll go pretty quick on these. X equals Y minus three plus one. So solving, I need to get rid of this plus one first. So I have X minus one equals square root Y minus three. Now I have to square both sides. So I got to put parentheses around it. Good news on this, you can just leave it like that, parentheses x minus 1 squared. It's a lot easier to deal with if you do that way. So now I have x minus 1 squared equals y minus 3. At 3, I have x minus 1 squared plus 3 equals y. All done. Now, writing it out uh, in proper notation, I have f inverse of x equals x minus one squared plus three. Got it. Now this one, that's a quadratic again. I know it's not gonna be one to one. So since I know it's not one to one, let's look at the original. I have square root of x minus three plus one. So looking at this one, I know this one's been shifted up one based on our knowledge about transformations. And looking at the graph, the lowest y value is one. So for this one, I know my range starts at one and goes up. So it's y greater than or equal to one. So taking this over to the domain, I now have that it is x greater than or equal to one. Now, if you're wondering, is that truly what it looks like? Take a gander. I have x minus one squared plus three. Looking at the graph, I have a problem. We know it's not one to one. Starting right here at one, I keep all the x's bigger. So covering this up, this is now a one to one function. I kept the right side. And that's it. So hopefully it's getting a little bit better for you. Now, at this point, you might be wondering, is it always going to be the right side? Answer is no, it won't. Take a look at these next two. So looking right here, let's go through it pretty quick. I have y equals negative square root x plus 6 plus 2, x equals negative square root y plus 6 plus 2, subtract the 2, there we go. Now I have to get rid of this negative. So to get rid of that negative, you can think about it as dividing by negative 1 or multiply by negative 1. That now turns this into negative x plus two equals square root y plus six. Square both sides. Equals y plus six. And now we have negative x plus two squared minus six equals y. Got it. Now, writing out our stuff, we know that we have f inverse of x equals negative x plus 2 squared minus 6. This one is a quadratic again. I know that it is not going to be 1 to 1. So looking at the original, I have negative 
square root x plus 6 plus 2. Looking at this, this one goes down. So I'm not going up forever anymore. So I'm now going down. The highest I ever go up to is 2. And again, we can get that from our transformations. So right here, my range, the highest I go to is 2, and then it goes down from there. So y is less than or equal to 2. That means that over here, my domain is less than or equal to 2. That is my answer. Now, as far as what that looks like, since I am less than or equal to 2, that is the left side of the graph. So taking a look at what that one looks like, I have parentheses x plus 2 squared minus 6. It's a problem, but I start right here at 2, and I keep the left side, because this portion corresponds to the part that was on that graph. If I were to keep this side and flip it, it would not match what was down here. So you have to be very careful and keep the correct domain. All right, so one more to kind of assure this up before we move on to the last page. Looking at this one, I'm going to go through it kind of quickly. I have y equals negative square root of x minus 4. This is now going to be x equals negative square root y minus 4. Take care of the negative. I now have negative x equals y minus 4 inside my square root, square both sides. Well, x squared is, or negative x squared is just going to be x squared. Remember, negative times a negative is a positive. Equals y minus 4, add the 4, I get x squared plus 4 equals y. All done. So now I have f inverse of x equals x squared plus 4, and I'm done. Now, this one is another quadratic, so I have to be very careful. Right here, looking at this one, I have negative square root x minus 4. This one starts at 0 and goes down. So for this, I know my range is y less than or equal to 0. Therefore, my domain for this one will be x less than or equal to 0, which if we were to reverse this and flip it, it would wind up being over here on this left side because this is my dotted line. Come over here, my x's are on the left side. All right, so after four examples, I really hope that you got a good grasp on that. It's not bad. If you know it's not one-to-one, -one, figure out the domain or the range of the original, and then you're going to figure out the domain of the new one using the original's range. All right, so we have one more page left, and then we'll be finished. All right. So on this page, we have some more inverses that we need to find, and we're going to find inverses of rational functions. Now, these look like they might be more complicated, and they do involve a little bit more detail algebra-wise, but they're actually pretty straightforward for the most part, as long as you don't mess up on your algebra steps. So the way we're going to work it is exactly the same as before. Looking at this one, I'm going to begin by changing f of x to y. And then I have 2x divided by 3x minus 1. Next step is the same as it has been. x equals 2y divided by 3y minus 1. All I did was switch the x and the y. Now, this is where we start to solve. And this is where you have to be a little detailed about what you're doing. 
To begin with, most people don't like rational functions because they're fractions. Well, the easy way to take care of this is to get rid of the denominator. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply both sides by the denominator, so 3y minus one. That way I can clear the denominator out and that'll make my life a little bit easier. So doing this, I have to distribute my x now. That's gonna give me 3xy minus x equals the denominator will cancel and I now have 2y. Now we no longer have to worry about a fraction. Well, at this point, keep in mind our end goal. Our end goal is to have y on one side and numbers with x's on the other side. So I wanna get everything that has a y on the same side and everything that doesn't have a y on the other side. So I'm gonna start by subtracting two y over to the side. So I have three x y minus two y. And now since this doesn't have a y, I'm gonna move it to the other side equals x. So again, get everything with a y on one side together and everything that doesn't have a y on the other side. Now looking at this, I see they both have a y in common so I can factor a y out. So I have y times three x minus two equals x. Now at this point, all I have to do is get y by itself by dividing by three x minus two. Once I do that, I now have y equals x divided by three x minus two. And y is by itself. Once y is on a side by itself, I can change it to f of x or f inverse equals x divided by three x minus two. Now this function right here, this is one to one. You can double check it in your calculator if you want. But since it's one to one, I don't have to worry about doing anything else. All done. So was the algebra a little bit more intensive? A smidgen, but nothing too crazy. All right, now if you need another example after that one, I understand. So I'm gonna go over one more. So looking right here at B, starting the same way, I have Y equals two X plus one divided by x minus one. Now switching, I have x equals two y plus one divided by y minus one. Doing the same stuff, I'm gonna multiply both sides by y minus one. I have to distribute here, so that's gonna give me x, y minus x equals 2y plus 1. Now again, I want everything that has a y on a side by itself and everything that doesn't on the other side. So I'm going to move this 2y over. So I have xy minus 2y. And now I'm going to move this x to this other side, x plus 1. Now I see these both have a y in common, so I'll factor a y out. And I have x minus 2 equals x plus 1. Now to get the y isolated, I'm going to divide both sides by x minus 2. That gives me y equals x plus 1 divided by x minus 2. y is on the side by itself, so I'm going to switch that over to f inverse x equals x plus 1 divided by x minus 2. And again, this is a one-to-one -one function. You can double check in your calculator if you wish. We are done. There's nothing else to be done on that. And that's inverses. So at this point, you know about one-to-one -one functions. You know the definition of inverses. You can find inverses if you have ordered pairs. You can find inverses if you have a graph. You can verify if two things are inverses or not. And you can also find the inverse written in function notation. If you have any questions about the material for this, please feel free to contact me. I'm always happy to help out. Other than that, have a great rest of your day.